What do you mean when you say that you believe in Jesus? Do you mean that you believe in the facts of the gospel? Well, today on Through the Bible, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, poses these important questions. Our study is in the book of John today, chapters 2 and 3. And we'll see that in these days, Jesus was doing a lot of miracles and a lot of people believed in him. But what did they believe? Now, that's an interesting question. In a few moments, we'll meet a fascinating man who was one of those who couldn't deny Jesus' miracles and was on a personal journey of exploration himself. His name was Nicodemus, and Dr. McGee has a lot to tell us about him. So as you get your Bible open to John chapter 2, verse 12, we got a minute or two, and I want to read some letters from the mailbag on the Bible bus. The first one's postmarked in Vancouver, Washington, and it says, I'm studying with Dr. McGee on my own time. It is wonderful. I have read the Bible many times over, but without a teacher by my side. I missed much insight into Scripture and how it all ties together and how the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Your radio program has blessed me for many years, since the 1970s. In fact, Dr. McGee had a great part in my making my commitment to Jesus Christ as my Savior long ago. May God continue to bless these programs going out to the world. I know God truly works through this, His Word. A fellow passenger in Marietta, California also shares this. I began listening to Through the Bible during a difficult time in my life, and it helped me greatly. Praise the Lord for His Word. I ask God daily to help me understand what I'm learning, and listening to Through the Bible has helped me a lot. I pray that God will protect and multiply your impact through radio and now through all the options that digital delivery has opened up. I pray daily that God will open the hearts and ears of his people. It says in his word that his word will not return void, and I believe it, and I see it through the letters that you read. Well, isn't that the truth? You know, we believe that God will accomplish all that he promises to do through his word, and letters from you are living proof of that. So keep them coming. Now, have you written to share how God has been good to you through these studies of his word? I sure hope that you'll do that if you haven't done it before. I know we would love to hear how God has used specific lessons. So why don't you share with the body of Christ the things that God's taught you? We think that you'll be encouraged by just the process of writing, and I'm sure you'll encourage us as well. So email your story to BibleBus at ttb.org or send your letter to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. If you live in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Father, thank you for opening our eyes to the beauties of your word. We come to it now, Lord, seeking you in each page that we read. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we were looking last time at that instance where the Lord turned the water into wine. And we believe that the most important part of that wedding was not the dress the bride wore, because nothing's even said about the dress or about her. And I'm sure she was around there somewhere. But the most important thing there were these six water pots of stone, beaten and battered, not very attractive, and our Lord took them empty. That's the way he takes you and me, saves us as sinners. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Fills us with the water of the word he wants to, and then ladle that out, and when it's ladled out, it'll become the wine of joy. That is the great message that's in this first miracle which he performed. Now, in verse 12, we are told, after this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Now, I believe that this is geared into that time when his hometown would not accept him. They, you remember, got rid of him when he went into the synagogue and read from Isaiah. And they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? And they probably would have destroyed him at that time. He moved his headquarters down to Capernaum. And as far as I can tell, that continued to be his headquarters during his three years ministry. And then you have in verse 13 now, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now we have another geographical point. Started out with Cana of Galilee, then it's Capernaum. Now it's Jerusalem. And we're told that he went up, and notice how John labels this. It's the Jews' Passover, no longer the Lord's. 
you see, this is the Jews' Passover. Just a religious feast now that's quite meaningless, just a ritual to go through, because the one of whom it speaks has now come, and Christ, our Passover, is offered for us. Now, our Lord went up to Jerusalem. This was now at the beginning of his public ministry. I think he'd been up there every year. All males were required to go three times a year at Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And he went up, and this was about April the 14th, by the way. We're geared into the geography and geared into the calendar also. Now we find here that he cleanses the temple. He did twice, once at the beginning of his ministry and again at the end of his ministry. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. They were selling animals, you see, the doves, and they were changing money. That is, it's quite interesting that they would not accept any kind except the temple money there, and it couldn't be any other kind offered. So they had an exchange place, and these men made money in making the exchange, by the way. When I came back from Venezuela some time ago, I came back with some Venezuelan money, and I wanted to get rid of it because I couldn't spend it here. And there was an exchange place in the airport, and I went up there and told them I wanted to change it for American money. And believe me, friends, I didn't get as much as when I made the trade the other way around, exchanging American money for Venezuelan money. And the believers that I turned in didn't do so well with them. That's the way they did here, you see. Somebody asked the question, why did they have this? Why did they do this? Well, the very fact that they were there is because they were making religion easy, very easy to come in and make the change there, and they would take the Roman coinage and the effigy of Caesar, the imprint of paganism, and they changed it into Jewish coin, and they were there for the convenience of the worshipers. Actually, they'd change large coins into smaller ones. Not only did they make religion easy, they made religion cheap. And I recognize that we ought not to overemphasize money in the church and beg, but I'll tell you something worse, and it's more intolerable than that. The fact that many people treat the church and the cause of Christ so cheap that it becomes necessary to sound an alarm at times. They were selling animals, and there's a lot of traffic in those sacrificial animals, a lot of trouble to raise sheep and oxen, and somebody would have to do it for you for a price. And it's very easy for it to become a religious racket. It was an opportunity also to make religion very comfortable, very easy. And today we have a great many ways of making our churches comfortable make everything convenient today. That's something that a great many people follow. And so we have today, I think, an anemic Christ as far as the church is concerned. They don't seem to realize just who he is. Now we find here that our Lord goes up to Jerusalem at this time, and he cleanses the temple. When he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. That means the money changers and the animals and those who sold, and the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the changers' money, and he overthrew the tables. I tell you, he was rough. No question about that. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And this is something that he quotes, of course. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's in Psalm 69, 9. And this is one of the six most quoted Psalms, by the way, in the New Testament, Psalm 69. It's quoted 17 times in the New Testament. It's quoted in the 15th chapter at verse 25 in this gospel, in chapter 19, verse 28. Now will you notice Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Destroy this temple. The word that he used 
is lucitai, which actually we get our word analysis from it. It means to untie, and he's referring here, and it does refer to the human body. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Now that was Herod's temple. It was still in process of being built, and it had been in the building forty six years. And they said, you don't mean to tell us that you will be able to destroy this temple. They use the naon, which means the holy place. And what our Lord is saying here, of course, is the temple of the body. And you remember Paul put it like this, that the holy place today is not a temple made with hands, but that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he said that he would raise it up. Egero, he'd raise it up. Paul, in the sermon in Antioch of Pisidian, Acts 13, he used the same word four times there, by the way. And it actually is a word that can mean wake up. And it refers, of course, to the resurrection, it refers to the resurrection of Christ, and it refers to the resurrection of believers also. And we're told in Acts 13, verse 30, but God raised him up from the dead. The idea is wake him up, the idea of waking up. And you have that in the raising up of Lazarus from the dead. It's a waking up. Lazarus, he said, come forth. And then you have him quoting also this, that he hath raised up Jesus again, verse 33, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It refers to the resurrection of Christ, you see. And that's what our Lord said to the little daughter of Jairus, the ruler. He said to her, Wake up, little lamb. And that's the picture that we have in this word. And that's what actually he means. He said he spake of the temple of the body. Now, even his disciples didn't catch that. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said that unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And they referred back to this after his resurrection three years later. Now we find this is his first public act when he went up to Jerusalem. And we come to something now that's intensely interesting, actually beginning at verse 23 we should just read right on into chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. And we have this incident that took place in Jerusalem during the Passover. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast, and it's not day, but just during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now a great many read that, and they say, why isn't it wonderful that the people are believing on him? But it wasn't wonderful, friends. This was not saving faith at all. They just merely nodded an assent when they saw the miracles that he did. Now notice what we have that follows this. But Jesus himself did not commit himself unto them. He did not believe. Actually, that is the language that is used here. He did not believe in them. They believed in him, but he didn't believe in them. In other words, actually their faith is not genuine faith, to put it very frankly. It wasn't saving faith at all. And that's always the grave danger today of those that say they believe in Jesus. Now, what do you mean when you say you believe in Jesus? Do you mean that you believe in the facts of the gospel? be pretty hard to contradict them. But those are saving facts. He died for your sins. Now, did he die for your sins? Do you trust him as your Savior from sin? Was he raised for your justification? Is he the living Savior at God's right hand today, the only hope that you have? That's important. Now, this crowd, they were interested. They saw him perform miracles. They believed. They had to. They were looking at them. But Jesus didn't believe in them. And he didn't believe that their belief was genuine, you see. 
because he knew all men. He knew what was in the human heart. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now it's on the basis of that that Nicodemus comes to him. In other words, the Lord Jesus didn't commit himself under the mob there. A great company believed on it. But this man Nicodemus came to him at night, and our Lord did commit himself under this man Nicodemus. This man's faith was genuine. And now let's look at that. And let me read it together without the chapter break, because here's an instance where the chapter break is unfortunate. It says, but Jesus himself did not believe in them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now this man is set apart from the mob. Our Lord didn't trust the mob. He knew their faith was not genuine. But this man Nicodemus is a genuine man. Now let's get acquainted with him. Three things are said about him here. The first thing is he was a man of the Pharisees. Now, that meant that he belonged to the best group in Israel. They believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. They believed in the coming of the Messiah. They believed in miracles. They believed in the resurrection. He was a man of the Pharisees. And his name was Nicodemus. That was his name. And he was a ruler of the Jews. I think, actually, these are the three masks that this man wore. Actually, this is a picture of modern man, if there ever was one. He was a man of the Pharisees when he met with them. He was in their midst, and he was just one of them. He more or less let down his guard. And then when he went out from the Pharisees, walked down the street, they'd see him coming, and the people would step off the sidewalk and see him coming, buying his robes and his phylacteries and prayer shawl. And they'd say, my, that is the ruler, Nicodemus. He's an outstanding man. He's a ruler of the Jews. And he adopted an altogether different attitude with them. But his name was Nicodemus. And down underneath these two masks that he wore, he was just plain little old Nicky, by the way. There are many men that live like this today. There's many a man that's a businessman. He's an officer in a corporation. He goes in of a morning, and those in the office speak to him. They call him Mr., and they bow and scrape to him. And they really don't know him. They think they do, but they don't know him. And then he leaves his office and probably has several customers that morning. And they ask him about business, and oh, he says business is great. Then he goes to his club at noon for lunch. And the minute he steps inside the club, he's a different man. He's not Mr. So-and-so, the president of a corporation. He's just now old plain Bill Jones or Joe Dokes that they play golf with, and they know him, and they call him by his first name. And he adopts a different attitude, different relationship. And they ask him about business, and he tells them, all oh, business is great. And then in the evening, when the work is all done, he goes home. He opens the door to his home. He steps in takes off his coat, drops down in the chair, and he's an altogether different man. In fact, very different man. His wife comes in and looks at him as he sits there dejected. He's taken off both of the masks that he wears. He's no longer the businessman, the head of a corporation, and he's no longer one of the fellows at the club. He's just plain little old whoever he is, plain little old Nicky. And his wife comes in, and she says to him, what's the matter, Bill? Is business bad? And he says, it's rotten. <laughs> That's who he really is. Now, this man, Nicodemus, he came to the Lord Jesus with a mask on. He came to him and he said, Rabbi, we know. Who's we? Why, we Pharisees. He comes as a man of the Pharisees. He wears that mask. We know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man and do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And he comes with a genuine compliment, by the way. He's no hypocrite. He said, we Pharisees have gotten together, and we know you're a teacher come from God. Now, I think that he came to talk about the kingdom of God. 
the Pharisees wanted to establish it and throw off the yoke of Rome. And they had no way of doing it. But here comes this one who's so popular. Multitudes are following him now. They want to get with him and hitch their little wagon to his star. And he probably has come from up in the country, up in Galilee, and he doesn't know how to deal with these politicians of Rome. They do. And so he comes in a condescending manner, and he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He had to recognize the miracles. They didn't doubt the miracles of our Lord, friends, in that day. You've got to be a professor in a seminary today, 2,000 years removed and several thousand miles removed from where it took place. And if you'd been back there, you wouldn't have denied the miracles. Now will you notice, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now that's the reason I think he came to talk about the kingdom of God. I see no reason why our Lord would have referred to it In other words, our Lord almost abruptly interrupts him and breaks in. And he says to him, the thing is, you can't even see the kingdom of God except you've been born again. Now, here's a man religious to his fingertips, and he's a Pharisee. And yet our Lord said to him, you won't even be able to see the kingdom of God except you be born again. And how important it would be for him to be born again. Now, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And our Lord said to him, to be born again, anothen, to be born from above. And this man, Nicodemus, can't think of anything but a physical birth. And he immediately, you see, drops the mask that he's been wearing, a man of the Pharisees condescending to Jesus and he becomes a ruler of the Jews. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Why, he said, don't you know, as a ruler of the Jews, I would know all about this. And then he points out how ridiculous it is. Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Well, the interesting thing is our Lord wasn't talking about a physical birth at all. But Nicodemus, you see, couldn't think of a spiritual birth at all. This man had no spiritual capacity to take it in. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I don't have time to enter into that myself today, but what does it mean to be born of water and of the Spirit? All right, let's save that until next time, and we'll talk about it then. So until then... May God bless you richly, my beloved. I love that interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus, don't you? I think it proves, once again, how Jesus responds to someone sincerely seeking the truth. Now, tomorrow, we'll hear how Jesus got underneath Nicodemus' two masks, the man of the Pharisees and the ruler of the Jews. As Dr. McGee will tell us, Nicodemus stood before Jesus as just plain little old Nicky. (laughs) Well, that conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus is all about how to have a relationship with God. And don't we all want to have the same thing? So if you'd too like to know more about how you can know God, then I'd invite you to go to ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? Or let us know that you'd like a few resources from Dr. McGee on this subject, and we'll mail them to you. You can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or email us at biblebus at ttb.org. Now, if you enjoyed our study today in John 3, then you might also like Dr. McGee's digital booklet, The Man Behind the Mask. It's available anytime at ttb.org forward slash booklets. Of course, it's for free. And while you're visiting us, be sure to check out the two other important tools that we think will help you go deeper in your daily studies yourself. The first is our new free digital Bible companion for John with the links to Dr. McGee's audio and God's Word, as well as some terrific reflection questions. Some listeners tell us that these Bible companions have revolutionized their study of God's Word. Now, the other tool that I'd recommend is our digital book, Briefing the Bible. That contains all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for our entire five-year study on the Bible bus. And it, too, of course, is available for free if you haven't already downloaded it. You can get a copy at ttb.org today. What does it mean to be born again? 
Well, next time, we'll eavesdrop on Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus and hear it straight from our Lord. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful to travel with you through God's amazing Word. Let's do it again next time. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. Be washed white as snow. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?